Welcome to this lecture on hemodynamic monitoring and approach to the hypotensive patient. Concepts in the management of shock, cardiovascular assessment and monitoring, brief assessment of fluid responsiveness and an approach to the hypotensive patient will be covered. Hypotension occurs when the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 mm of mercury the mean arterial pressure is less than 65 mm of mercury or when there is a decrease in systolic blood pressure from baseline of more than 40 mm of mercury. Shock is a life-threatening form of acute circulatory failure in which there is reduction in tissue oxygen delivery below that required to meet metabolic demands. This imbalance in oxygen delivery and demand results in tissue hypoxia and lactate acidosis. If not reversed, it leads to progressive cellular injury, multi-organ failure and death. Tissue oxygen delivery is dependent upon the complex balance between blood flow and perfusion pressure at both global and local levels. This is represented in the clinical context by two end parameters, namely blood pressure and oxygen carriage. Oxygen carriage is represented by the oxygen flux equation as shown here, in which cardiac output is a key factor. Examination of the determinants of blood pressure and oxygen carriage reveals four primary cardiovascular parameters which may contribute to a state of shock. These four parameters are preload, cardiac myocardial contractility, heart rate, and systemic vascular resistance. This forms the basis of categorization of shock. Shock can be classified into three categories based on etiology. Hypovolemia is the most common cause of shock. Inadequate circulating volume results from blood loss, fluid loss or third space sequestration. There is reduced preload, increased cardiac output and increased afterload. Treatment is with volume replacement. Cardiogenic shock is due to myocardial pump dysfunction. Treatment is with inotropes and coronary revascularization if applicable. In distributive shock, there is inappropriate vasodilation and maldistribution of blood flow within the microcirculation. Cardiac output is typically preserved or increased. Common causes include severe sepsis, neurogenic shock, and anaphylaxis. Treatment is with intravenous fluids and vasopressors. Methods of cardiovascular assessment and monitoring include clinical and biochemical parameters, the arterial waveform, cardiac output monitors, and echocardiography. Shock may affect many organ systems. Clinical manifestation of shock includes confusion, tachycardia, hypotension, oliguria, and tachypnea. Other peripheral signs include skin mottling, cold extremities, and impaired capillary refill. The measurement of biochemical parameters can indirectly assess global tissue oxygenation and perfusion. Commonly used parameters include serum lactate as well as mixed and central venous oxygenation. The arterial catheter is one of the most common interventions in the ICU and allows invasive blood pressure monitoring. The pressure transducer must be placed at the level of the heart. If the level is placed too high, this will lead to an under-reading of the blood pressure. If the level is too low, this will cause an over-reading of the blood pressure. 
Transducer kits are designed to provide optimal damping of the pressure waveform. Underdamped trays will display an inaccurately high systolic blood pressure and an inaccurately low diastolic blood pressure. The converse is true in an overdamped trays. In both cases, the mean arterial pressure should be accurate. A square wave test can be done to ascertain if the tracing is under or over damped. In an optimally damped trace, there should be one to two oscillations before a return to the baseline. Common causes of overdamping include an underinflated pressure bag, bubbles in the catheter transducer system, kinked or clotted cannula or tubing, or arterial spasm. Common causes of underdamping include excessive tubing length and a hyperdynamic circulation. In the search for the etiology of a shock state or in the ongoing monitoring and circulatory optimization of the critically ill patient, it may be desirable to measure and monitor the changes in cardiac output. Numerical values for cardiac output may be obtained by invasive or minimally invasive means. These include the pulmonary artery catheter, transpulmonary dilution, and pulse contour techniques as well as esophageal Doppler. We will focus on the Vigilio flow track system which is commonly used in our ICUs. The flow track system is attached to a standard arterial line at any site. This system requires no calibration and derives cardiac output from a nomogram based upon age, sex and weight. Absence of calibration increases the ease of use but renders it less accurate than calibrated pulse contour analysis systems. This system also allows the measurement of stroke volume variation or SVV and pulse volume variation or PVV. This brings us to the topic of assessment of preload responsiveness. Preload responsiveness is the ability of the heart to significantly increase stroke volume in response to volume expansion. Measurement of preload responsiveness is not appropriate in the resuscitation of massive fluid loss, where volume replacement is clearly required. Rather, it is in the resuscitated patient, in whom preload status is unclear, where an assessment of preload responsiveness may be beneficial in the optimization of hemodynamics. This can be broadly divided into static and dynamic parameters. Static parameters include cardiac filling pressures, such as the central venous pressure. However, there is little evidence uh, of the central venous pressure as a reliable predictor of preload responsiveness. Dynamic parameters may be broadly divided into those dependent on cardiorespiratory interactions and those based up upon response to a fluid challenge. Intrathoracic pressure varies throughout the respiratory cycle decreasing during inspiration in normal negative pressure ventilation and increasing during inspiration in artificial positive pressure ventilation. An increase in intrathoracic pressure impedes venous return and vice versa. This respiratory variation may be observed as a variation in stroke volume or pulse pressure. The magnitude of respiratory variation is increased in hypovolemia. An SVV or PVV of greater than 10 to 13 percent predicts preload responsiveness. However, this holds true 
only in mechanically ventilated patients with no spontaneous breaths and who are receiving tidal volumes of between 8 to 10 mL per kg of ideal body weight. The most common physiological limitations to the use of PVV can be summarized as here limits. An alternative cardiorespiratory relationship that predicts fluid responsiveness but remains valid in the presence of arrhythmia and which may be used in a spontaneously breathing patient is the variation in the IVC diameter. Hypovolemia leads to a reduction in the diameter of the IVC at all points in the respiratory cycle and a more marked reduction in IVC diameter when the intrathoracic pressure drops. The IVC distensibility index can be used in mechanically ventilated patients where a change of more than 18% is indicative of fluid responsiveness. The IVC collapsibility index can be used for spontaneously breathing patients where a change of more than 42% is indicative of fluid responsiveness. IVC variation is assessed using ultrasound in the subcostal position. The picture illustrates the anatomical structures on a subcostal view as well as the M-mode ultrasound of the IVC in a spontaneously breathing patient. Volume status should be assessed against the Frank-Starling curve. A preload challenge is administered with a view to increase the stroke volume or cardiac output, usually measured on a cardiac output monitor. This can take the form of an actual fluid bolus or a passive leg raising test. Crystalloids include balanced crystalloid solutions and normal saline. Excess chloride content in normal saline may cause a normal anion gap acidosis and there may be evidence that excess saline is associated with increased risk of renal failure. Hartman solution and commercially available balanced electrolyte solutions such as plasmalite or sterofundin are examples of balanced crystalloids. Colloids in the form of 5% or 20% albumin may also be used. Hydroxyethyl starch solutions are not recommended in critically ill patients because of an increased risk of kidney injury or mortality. In order to do a passive leg raise, first sit the patient at 45 degrees heads up in, in a semi-recumbent position. Lower the patient's upper body to horizontal and passively raise the legs at 45 degrees upwards. A maximal effect occurs at 30 to 90 seconds. Assess for a 10% increase in stroke volume using a cardiac output monitor. Those with a positive response to the strict leg raise can subsequently receive fluids. If you are called to see a patient who is hypotensive, first review the history and examine the patient to determine the possible causes. Determine if the patient would likely be responsive to fluids and administer accordingly. Then reassess for fluid responsiveness following a fluid bolus. This is a quick overview of the available inotropes and vasopressors commonly used in our ICUs, along with the mode of action, dosing, as well as common indications. These will need to be run through central lines. Septic shock is the most common cause of shock seen in the medical ICU. In the context of septic shock, noradrenaline followed by vasopressin and adrenaline infusions are the most commonly used in our ICUs. Start intravenous hydrocortisone at 50 mg every 6 hours in patients who are unresponsive to fluids 
and vasopressor therapy. This is a list of resuscitation drugs available in e-cards. This has been standardized across all campus locations. Note the addition of pre-diluted adrenaline in a 1 is to 10,000 formulation and phenylephrine in 1 mg per 10 ml vials. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha adrenergic vasoconstrictor. A pre-diluted version is available in the emergency cart where 1 ml is equivalent to 100 micrograms. It is usually given as a 1 to 2 ml bolus push to rapidly resuscitate hypotensive patients. Adrenaline is available in a pre-diluted 1 is to 10,000 formulation where 1 mg of adrenaline is pre-diluted to 10 ml. An alternative is to draw undiluted adrenaline in a 1 is to 10,000 formulation and dilute with normal saline to a total of 10 ml. In cardiac arrest, give 1 mg of adrenaline as a bolus. For rapid resuscitation of profoundly hypotensive patients, 1 is to 10,000 adrenaline can be given very cautiously in small boluses whilst awaiting vasopressor infusions to be prepared.